the exponential rewards you receive as a reaction to the service that you give is phenomenal. And if everybody understood that you get back in spades what you put in, in terms of service, not only would everybody's lives be more fulfilled, I mean, can you imagine a society that looked like that? I'm Bill Courtney and I share hope. Welcome to I Share Hope, the podcast where world leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. I was reading about you and there's really a lot there. I think the 2011 documentary Undefeated is what really spun a lot of your public that's what's fun at all. Yeah. And you got an account. I'm an anonymous. Board. Yeah. I'm an anonymous guy with a lumber company coaching football and three guys from LA with one credit to their name, <laughs> which was the, uh, a very heartfelt, um, warm documentary on the world series of beer pong. That's the one thing these guys had <laughs> ever done in their life. <laughs> they show up wearing hipster clothes and carrying a couple of cameras, you know, no satellite trucks, no big boom mics, nothing. Yeah. In fact, this equipment here is more than likely probably a little more sophisticated than what they had. <laughs> and they said, we want to, we want to film you and do a little short documentary, like an ESPN 30 for 30. Yeah. Stayed two days, said, this is a bigger story than that. We're going to go try to raise some money. We'll be back and shoot a movie. And I said, we'll see you later. And it was three weeks before the season started. So I thought I'd never see him again. Sure. They show up in three weeks with two cameras, same three guys, no boom mics, no nothing and start recording. And they leave Memphis with 560 hours of film, go back and edit for a year and make a movie. I think no one will ever see maybe on channel 422 on Wednesday at three in the morning. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And seven months later, I'm walking down the red carpet, at the Academy Awards. Unbelievable. It is absolutely unbelievable. So the award was for best documentary of the year. best feature documentary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a real live Oscar Academy Award deal. Absolutely. That's great. Congratulations. Yeah. And now oh, a book uh, early this year came out and here's what caught my attention. The reason I wanted to call you, there's a, uh, a quote in there. There are countless others who prove that regardless of how difficult their circumstances might be, human beings can turn their lives around. It's never too late. And, and that comes after a paragraph of example after example after example of just amazing folks that have worked for you or you worked with in the past who've come or, or who I've coached or have coached yeah. me or I've been involved with in society or politics or whatever. But it's, it's absolutely true. There's, if there's air in your lungs and the sun comes up, hmm. you have hope for a better day. Yeah. Period. And, but that's the whole, the title of the book against the grain is specifically meant that we have to go against the grain of conventional wisdom and thought. Um, you know, you see a guy wearing a suit and, and a briefcase driving a nice car run around who volunteers in his church. And everybody would say, well, look, he's got it made. Mm -hmm. You have no idea what's going on inside that guy's head and heart. And you have no idea the struggles that that person deals with and the sex addiction or the alcohol addiction or, or whatever. So true. The flip side is you see a guy working out here on this yard making nine dollars and 50 cents an hour covered in grease, wearing two year old coveralls, driving a hoopty back home. And you say, well, poor guy, he's working hard. You have no idea the love and hope that could be in his heart with his yeah. family and, mm -hmm. and his, and his, and his faith and, and his approach to life and his relationship with his kids. And the, the point is we characterize far too quickly and there are, there's so much that is going on inside each individual, each one of us, despite where we come from, despite our circumstances, despite the, the, the life or the road we've taken or laid out for ourselves, um, that we all have issues and we all have triumphs, but no matter what, when the sun comes up and you wake up and take that first cognizant breath of fresh air, mm -hmm. if you just look at the people around you and look at the examples of amazing people who've done amazing things, I don't know how you cannot have hope mm -hmm. for a better day. It's well said. It's hard to believe that some days when you're the guy without the hope, but um, getting through the next day and getting down the road a little bit helps you get a little more perspective. And well, and I get it. And I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. You can be surrounded by a thousand people and be the most lonely human on earth. Yeah. 
And, and, and I get that goes on, but what I'm trying to, trying to, in that portion of the book, the book is not about this, but it's that portion of the book. What I'm trying to say is if you're that lonely person, Mm -hmm. take a second, um, remove yourself from yourself. Don't, don't take the face off of yourself and, and look at the people around you and the examples that we have of people who have, despite all circumstances and despite past transgressions and despite all their past failings have, have found a way to pull themselves up. And if they can do it, you can do it. Mm-hmm. The, the first chapter and against the grain about Sam Quinn, um, Sam works here now, but when Sam came to me, he was, um, a 40 year old living at lighthouse ministries, uh, three time addict, drug addict, alcohol addict, everything, uh, was a former Marine, um, had, had nothing. And he started working here as a laborer, as a 40 year old for, I think $7, 25 cents an hour. Hmm. Seven years later, Sam is married. And I don't mean living with a shack up, honey. I mean, got the piece of paper married, <laughs> adopted her three children, coaches them, lives in a 2000 square foot house in Frazier is a manager here, making a mid five figure salary and has gotten rid of all the DUI back stuff has wow. cleared all his name from the courts and is a model citizen and an integral part of my business that happened in seven years from lighthouse ministry addict with a, a, a rap sheet you would not believe to married children home great job and living a fulfilled life and the best thing about it is every day he gets to look in the mirror and be proud of who he sees yeah. If that guy can do it, you should have hope that anybody can do it. You're right. It's a good story. It's a great story. Yes. So, it's the first chapter of the book. It's why I open with it. Let me get into the five questions. We have five questions we ask each person that we interview on okay. hope. Uh, first one, your definition of hope or the best definition you've heard or quote about hope. It's, it's really just the way I, 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 I look at hope. Um, uh, Hope is a, a, a positive attitude despite your past. Hmm. Um, hmm. having a, a, a positive outlook and a, an energy to keep going despite all of your past transgressions and failings. Wow. And to have that kind of hope, I think you have to understand forgiveness and grace. Hmm. Um, I think you have to understand that you, can be forgiven for anything you've done mm-hmm. if you genuinely ask for that forgiveness and are willing to make amends. Mm-hmm. And I think the other part of forgiveness that's even more important than that is I think we have to be able to understand we have to forgive ourselves. Oh. And if you find forgiveness and grace in your heart and seek forgiveness and are able through that forgiveness to be able to forgive yourselves, then you can let your past failings and transgressions go and have a positive outlook for tomorrow. That's how I see hope. That's great. Getting rid of our our own bad thoughts about ourselves is a big deal. It's the For, worst. Forgiving myself. It's easier to forgive somebody else than me. It's so much easier to forgive somebody else than yourself. Yeah. It is. But you 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 have to you have to understand if if you can't forgive yourself, then the forgiveness you offer someone else is fairly shallow. You're right. Good point. All right. The um next one. Who's been the most helpful in delivering hope to you? Who's given you the most hope growing up, now, whenever? Uh, Christ. Hmm. Um, because I am a fallen, wretched human being. Hmm. And I'm, I'm, um, I do things on a daily basis that, um, that I, I regret. But I'm able to, I'm not able to, to say it's okay because I believe in God. Mm-hmm. But what I am able to do is to leave that stuff at his feet and, uh, wake up the next day without the burden of that guilt, mm-hmm. which gives me hope that I can be better and that I can do better on a daily basis. So honestly, that's where my hope comes from on earth. Maybe a, a more, uh, maybe the, uh, an illustration you might be looking for more uh, looking for your answer. And that was, an well, answer. that, that is my answer, but also a guy like Sam Quinn, hmm. 
Uh, not, not, you know, not the president of the United States or some guy who's, I, it's who, you know, the people who inspire me and hope is, is when I look at the everyday guy Mm -hmm. who, who wakes up every day and does the very best he can and is, is proud of their efforts. I mean, those type of people give me the most hope because I believe our society is only strong as its weakest link. And we have a lot of weak links and a lot of people that suffer from disenfranchisement and, and sorrow and abject despair and poverty and loss. And when I look at just normal folks do something to better their lives and better their families' lives, then I know that's available for everybody if they'll just do it. And that gives me hope for a better society and a better country and a better world. Beautiful. Powerful. All right. When's a time when you've had to really rely on hope? You've just hit the bottom uh, personally, not somebody else's story when it's, when it's been a, a time that hope's really all you had to go back to or something you're really pulling hard and, and kind of paint the picture. Give us the, I, I, the view. I, I started this business in 2001 off my couch with $10,000. I was 31 years old. Wow. I had a one year old, a two year old, a three year old, and a four year old wow. and a wife. A few mouths to feed. A few mouths to feed. And I was uh, 31 and the vice president of a pretty large company making a lot of money. Mm-hmm. I was being very well paid. Um, and I quit and started this company. Hmm. And from that point until 2006, we rolled along pretty well and grew and went from six employees to, you know, I was at 120 employees and we we're doing about 40 million in sales and the, the bubble hit, the, the economy's bubble hit. Yeah. Um, I got my books, my, my profit and loss statement. I, I get that every 30 days on the 15th of the following month. And we had lost everything we'd made the previous nine months of that one 30 day period because of the economy hit. Oh my goodness. To give you some perspective, the hardwood lumber industry in 2002 produced 14 and a half billion board feet. By this time it was producing four. Wow. Serious shrinkage. It was happening all around us. Wow. Friends of mine in business were going bankrupt. My customers were going bankrupt. Mm-hmm. And, um, I laid at the ceiling and I laid in bed and stared at the ceiling thinking I'm done. Mm-hmm. That Sunday, um, I got up and I got the books out and I started slashing. I'm like, okay, how can I survive? That following Monday, I, I came to work and I, I had to lay off 60 people that day ish between 50 and 60 people. And I'm talking about people been with me since day one that done nothing wrong. Yeah. And I knew mm-hmm. that they were going to have to drive home going into the worst economy we've seen since the Great Depression and look their families in the face and say, I don't have a job anymore. Wow. So I knew not only what I was facing, what my business was facing, but because of my failure to be able to keep this place where it needed to be, despite the external pressures of the economy, I saw it as a personal failure. And because of that personal failure, I was sending 60 people home to a – a a dire situation. Mm-hmm. Um and and I, I'm telling you, it was the toughest day of my life. I left, I drove home from this place that day and bawled. I bet. Because not honestly, I, I was worried. It'd be disingenuous to say I wasn't worried about me and the business, but I, I was worried about, you know, what have I done? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. um despite it I knew that I did what I had to do to try to save for the whole, the greatest that I could. And we did. And when the industry went from 14 and a half billion to four billion, we took a step back that year. And then over the remaining six years of this recession that we're just now coming out of, Mm -hmm. my business has doubled. I'm back to 120 million employees, uh, 120 employees. We're back up around 45 million in sales. I've got offices all over Asia and Europe. It's great. Uh, the facility you see here. And, and I'm telling you, I didn't have much that day that I had to lay off everybody mm-hmm. except hope. Wow. Wow. That's powerful. And then in that process, so you've come through that, obviously. The hope paid off, so to speak. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I mean relationally and everything. Yeah, but it wasn't just blind hope. Yeah. It was hope that the decisions that I was making were the right ones for the, the majority of people around me, from my children and wife to my employees to myself. But I, I just don't think you can have blind hope. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I think you garner a greater sense of hope if you look yourself in the mirror and make tough decisions and and make the choices 
that inspire hope. Right. So I, I knew that hope would carry me, mm-hmm. but I also knew that it was my job to foster hope. Yeah. Not only amongst, uh, not, not, not only just for me, but amongst those, because can you imagine the shock value of the employees left sitting around here? They wonder if they're going next. They wonder if they're going next. Wonder if place is going bankrupt. My mm-hmm. wife's wondering if we're going to have a house. My kids are wondering where they're going to go to school. Sure. And to foster hope for those around you, mm-hmm. you have to make the best decisions, communicate those decisions, to those around you, explain the situation, be honest, look yourself in the mirror, be honest with yourself and be honest with those around you and say, okay, look, it's tough. Here's where we are, but here's the steps we're taking to be successful. And we need to go to work because these steps will work and these steps and, and this, these actions should foster hope for a brighter future. That's, and that's what we did. That is so critical. I think that's important for folks listening that, that it, hope is not blind. And if it's just blind, it's optimism and it's, it's not founded. But if it's got legs and got a plan and has steps and has a, a reasonable expectation of becoming something, then that's hope. I may, that's hope. I may hope I'm the next CEO of Google and I, think that's a pretty optimistic hope that probably won't happen, <laughs> but, uh, hoping that I get to walk my kids to school tomorrow morning and they have a great day at school is a pretty realistic hope. And I know how to help ensure that happens. Hope that, that the hope that these types of conversations reach 10,000 and a hundred thousand and 200,000 is a realistic hope. If you yeah. keep doing a good job and keep taking the steps, you got to go and keep working at it and keep getting interesting people to sit in front of your microphone for you. Those are things that can happen. Exactly. That's a realistic hope. Right. You can say, man, I, I, I hope I make it to the NBA one day. Well, what are you doing to work on that? <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and, and is it a realistic goal for you? And, and I think, I think unrealistic goals actually diminish hope. Mm-hmm. But if you, if you think about what realistic goals are and you, and you methodically take steps to work toward those goals and you pour yourself into it, then I think you and those around you can see the realism of the goals, can see the effort, and will also join in you with hope for what your what your goals are, what you're seeking. Ooh, that's really good. Really is good. All right, what are you doing today? And this is question number four. What are you doing today to bring hope to other folks around you, other people uh, here internationally, Memphis, local, uh, you call it, wherever? I don't know. I mean, that's that. I read that question. I thought, you know, that's. I, I don't. I don't want to break my break my shoulder, pat myself on the back. I mean, no. I wrote a book that I hope inspires hope. Mm-hmm. Um, I speak all over the country and I talk about servant leadership, getting out of your comfort zone, understanding the value of your legacy um, hmm. that I hope uh, inspires people to think about themselves and their, their places and their family and their business and their society and their politics a little differently. Mm-hmm. And, and, I really do think that inspires hope for a greater future individually. I agree. Um, uh, so, and, and frankly, in my, in my business, I mean, you know, it's, I'm still in the lumber business and building is not the greatest thing in the world. And so, you know, I, I continue to work hard around here and to, to lead as an example and, and inspire hope to the employees of Classic American Hardwoods that we're going to keep doing the right things and we're going to keep growing and we're going to keep building and people are going to get more and more out of this business in terms of salaries and bonuses if we continue to work hard together. So there's hope for a bright, a continued and brighter future for the employees of my business. Mm -hmm. Hope for my children that they can get, go to the college they want to and pursue the careers they have and, and hope for my wife that, that all of the work we have done with our family and the business, um, lands us in our twilight years with a beautiful, happy, healthy family and, mm. and the ability to, uh, to enjoy it. Sure. That's good. And so again, I'm hearing hope with legs on it. There's a plan. It has to, yeah, well, yeah, there's action. You're doing something. You have to yeah, I, I just, you know, if you just say, well, I hope this is going to happen. And then you go sit in a chair and wait for it to happen. I just think that's foolish. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned a few things every now and then about you and something you hope happens to you, but 99% of the things you're saying are all focused on others. And I keep hearing that with other people I'm interviewing, that it's giving, 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 and you get so much in return because of that. But if you stay focused on delivering some hope to another, you end up getting a whole lot more back. The exponential rewards you receive as a um, 
reaction to the service that you give hmm. is phenomenal. And if everybody understood that you get back in spades what you put in in terms of service, mm -hmm. not only would everybody's lives be more fulfilled, but, I mean, can you imagine a society look, looked like that? Oh, it'd be incredible. Yeah. Really but, good. But, but it's, it, and, and maybe that's a idealistic, utopian, you know, dream. But the point is, the more you talk about hope and the more you inspire others to serve and the more you, you inspire proper leadership and the more you throw away political correctness and replace it with open, civil, non-threatening conversations about the stuff that matter, that's the stuff that gives me hope mm -hmm. for a better society and country and future for my kids. That makes sense. Okay. Last question. Somebody listening call it hopeless because they have a chemical addiction or they've lost a job, financial trouble, relational problems, whatever it may be. Give me some steps, the ABC, one, two, three, some real simple. How do we get started pursuing hope for ourselves and for others around us? Got to be honest with yourself. Okay. Be honest. Number one. Um, you you got to be willing to look yourself in the mirror and acknowledge the scars. Hmm. And second, once you are honest with yourself and, and recognize what you're doing wrong, then you have to immediately rid yourself of the guilt of that mm -hmm. guilt will keep people from doing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. The woe is me, mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. So you got to be honest with yourself, acknowledge what's going wrong in your life. And then you've got to recognize and you got to buy into this. We are all failed. We, 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 every human being has skeletons in their closet that one, they never want anybody to know about. <laughs> and two are so similar to everybody else's. Yeah. And, and you don't have to know the specifics of them to just know that everybody deals with immense pain mm. and, and tremendous guilt and the things that they've done that they're ashamed of. And, 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 and tremendous second guessing of who they are and what they're about and, and the search for what you are. So if, if you're in a rut, one, be honest with yourself and admit you're in a rut. And mm -hmm. if it's a, if it's a, an addiction to drugs or alcohol or porn or, or a big one, ego. Yeah. If it's an addiction to, you know, whatever, whatever your issues are, one, admit it. Just for once in your life, just look yourself in the mirror and be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. And then two, immediately recognize that every one of us deal with something, mm -hmm. at least one something, typical multiple something. Sure. So don't feel guilty about it and don't think you're the worst human being in the world because you're not and understand that we're, we're all failed. Mm -hmm. And once you admit it, and once you are able to get forgive yourself and get rid of the own guilt about it and recognize that we're all in this boat together in mm -hmm. terms of our emotional fears and inhibitions and self-consciousnesses and all of that. Sure. Then get a snapshot of what you want to be first hmm. um, in terms of a, a father or a mother, in terms of a parent, in terms of a business associate, in terms of somebody in your society. And from that point, work your way back and, and itemize some steps that you think would be necessary to make that happen. And then don't worry about the goal anymore. Once you get the steps, mm -hmm. just go to step one and hammer it. And once you get to step one, then from there catapult to step two and hammer it wow. and, and forget, don't look 50 miles down the road. Yeah. Look, look, Look a mile down the road and get that mile behind you. Sure. And then look three miles down the road and get those three miles behind mm -hmm. you. And over the course of time, what you will find is each time you reach a hurdle, you can have hope for the next one because you've proven to yourself you can do it. Mm -hmm. And every hurdle that you get behind you, you get farther and farther away from that person that you had to be honest with and feel guilty about. Yeah, good point. And then in some number of months or years, once you start, once you get close or to the goal that you want to be, mm -hmm. then you will have evolved into a whole new person and there will be a new goal. Ah, good point. And yeah. then do it again. Yeah. And, and you can inspire people by your actions and, and, and that process will always give you hope to continue to develop and evolve and do better. Oh, that's great. So being honest with myself, 
then getting rid of the guilt. I'm not the only one out there that's got problems. No, man. And then getting a plan, get some friends, counselor, uh, family members, whatever, to help me get a plan, some steps together to move on from where I am today to where I want to be. Then forget about that long range too big to reach. Well, first, once you, once you get where it. you want to be, yeah. then work back the steps that you need to do to get and there. And then focus on the steps. And then forget yeah. the goal. Great. And go first step. Once it's behind you, second step. Once it's behind you, third step. And when you get to third step, now you have a ton of hope and belief because look what you've done already. Yeah. See, a lot of people say, I want to get to this goal. They get halfway there and they feel like they failed. No, sir. Every step is an accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And you need to build on that accomplishments rather than the goal being the accomplishments, it's the steps that are accomplishments. And eventually you will, you will continue to gobble up steps and get oh, there. Yeah. And three quarters of the way to that original goal, that goal may not be your goal anymore. A new goal might change. So right. start over. Yeah. But you know, you can do it and you can have hope you can do it because you've, you've accomplished many goals along the way. Sure. Oh, that's great. And this, by the way, isn't against screen. <laughs> that sounds that's like a shameless plug, but it really is. It's, it's in there. It's, that's the point. You've, uh, you've got a lot of people asking the same questions I'm asking and you put it down on paper so we could all read it. To be honest with you, I never wanted to write a book. I did, <laughs> I did, well, I did all these speeches. And after two years of doing speeches all over the place, I'd have people come up and do you have it on disc? Where's the book? And I'm yeah. like, I run a lumber company and coach football. I do this occasionally as a side gig, this isn't what I do. So I'm not like this guy that's out there with the whole yeah. change your life thing. Right. right. And, but you know, I talked to my agent and I said, everybody keeps asking me about books. He said, you should write a book. So basically the book is in response to the Q and A's that I got hmm. after all these speeches. Yeah. And so I arranged the book in a way that I thought we could talk about some stuff that mattered uh, in a civil, non-threatening way, but also address so much of what the speeches revealed to me people were thinking about. Mm -hmm. Love it. All right, so the book, Against the Grain. Yep. And the movie is on Netflix. That's where I saw it, Undefeated. I'm sure you can pick it up on Amazon and everywhere else. Yeah, yeah. The book but, on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, the movie, I think, is actually still at Amazon and Target. But, I, I mean, at it, it Barnes & Noble Target, I know it's at Amazon. It's live streaming on Netflix and... Um, How do people find you if they want to follow you online, websites, Twitter, Facebook? Uh, if, if you want to know more about all this stuff, you can go to coachbillcourtney.com. Okay. You can follow me on Twitter at I am Coach Bill and at Coach Bill Says. Um, there's links to all of this on coachbillcourtney.com. Yeah, I saw the links. There's a lot there, folks. If, you, if you're going to look for this, please start there. And there's an excerpt of the book on that website as well that's definitely worth looking at. And you'll see some quotes by some amazing people who gotten deeper in the book and it's it really is incredible i appreciate it last thing when you're trying to get your head back in gear and you're hitting the road you're going to drive across town what are you going to listen to what's going to take you home and get you out of the funk <laughs> I, I, I saw that and, and you know what's funny I love you, this question. you know what I, I, it's a tough question <laughs> it because it, it 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 changes based on the day it does for me too i, I will sometimes listen to zz top i love it yeah. just because i want to hear that <laughs> yeah i will I will oftentimes listen to you two pride in the name of love is my favorite song. That's I will play one. that song 16 times over and over again. If I want to feel young again, I'll listen to cheap trick because that's the first concert I ever went to. Love it. Ironically enough, the lead guitarist who played the five arm guitar for cheap trick. Yeah. His name is uh, Rick Nielsen. His son has a band and he wrote the score for undefeated. Really? How weird is that? The first concert I ever went to. Incredible. Is it, that a it, connection that you made or did they? It just completely just really? happened. Yeah, absolutely. It was the craziest thing in the world. So did you get to meet uh, any guys? Oh, yeah, team? absolutely. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In, right fact, in fact, I was in Palm Springs and hung out with the, the, the drummer for them uh, at a wedding and they were just about to go do. They're still working. They do. Anyway, that's all. Oh, and and I, I will tell you, I will also um, spend a lot of time with Fox News and CNN on XM Radio, and I will listen to Fox for 10 minutes and CNN for 10 minutes, and I'll go back and forth. Just to keep it balanced? I, well, it really is an interesting exercise to compare the spin on the same story. Yeah, it is. And to, and to recognize that there's 10% crazies on the right, and there's 10% crazies on the left, and the 80% of us in the middle are rarely represented. Yeah, I like how you say the 80% in the middle. And 
We That's all, who we are. We all want to think we're the normal ones in the middle, right? <laughs> uh, well, I, I just I just believe that, unfortunately, part of the polarization of what's going on in our country is as a result of our media pulling us one way or the other. When the yeah. when the when I sit down and talk to Democrats and Republicans and liberals and conservatives, the vast majority of us agree with about 85 percent really of true. the same thing. Yeah. The problem is we become our, our, our representatives in in politics and the media have become so polarized that they're separating us. Mm-hmm. And I just think we need to take us back and and have civil, non-threatening conversations about the stuff that matters and tell the crazy pundits to go to hell. This is a whole nother podcast. It really is. <laughs> I should work on that. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. I'm Bill Courtney, happy to do amazing it. time. Thanks for your help and all the really easy, usable one, two, threes, how to do it all throughout. I appreciate having me. Thanks for your time. You've just listened to I Share Hope. If you're ready to make a change, head to our website at ishareHope.com and claim your free copy of the top 10 actions of hope from world leaders to use hope in your own life. Thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you next time.